Hello and welcome to The Gentleman Talks, uh, our series of one-to-one -one interviews with ladies and with gentlemen. Um, we're here to talk about their lives, um, their work, and what's influenced them, uh, all within the framework of our mission to make the world a more respectful, stylish, and gentlemanly place. And I'm here today, it's my really my great pleasure to welcome a friend of mine, Edward Sahakian. Uh, Edward uh, is the owner of uh, the Davidoff store on the corner of German Street and St. James's Street. Edward, welcome. Thank you, Nick. It's a pleasure to be here. And those of you, in the, those of you who know the cigar business may, may know Edward, but for those who don't, Edward, tell us a, a little about, the, about your store, your wonderful store. Well, uh, I had the cigar shop now for last week nearly, for 33 years. Wow. It was 1980. Circumstances in my life brought me to London. As you probably know, I was originally born and grew up in Iran. Our family business was totally different. We were into breweries and soft drinks. And with the Islamic uh, Revolution, it was not appropriate to continue to produce and sell beer as it has alcohol in it. And uh, I had to change course of life. Came to London with my family. And while settling down, I really needed to think about the future various aspects of it, uh, immigration, taxation, everything else. So on appropriate day, very early, within a month or two of moving over, I went to see a solicitor, asking him all the questions. What should I do? What should I not do? How should I do it? And in the course of our conversation, he was a young gentleman, just graduated from Cambridge, and explained to me all the do's and don'ts of life. And I took my pen out to make notes. He said, oh, don't worry, Mr. Sarkin. Uh, it's very simple. Opened the drawer, gave me three pages of paper. He said, just read and follow these instructions, and you will have no problem. And I said, well, thank you very much, sir. And as it was customary in our country in those days, you never left a doctor or a solicitor's office without paying. It was. <laughs> Uh, and right. the session you had to pay for it before you left it. And I said, well, shall I pay you by check, credit card, cash? I said, well, no, not really. I haven't done anything. It was a pleasure to meet you and we'll just leave it at that. Obviously, being embarrassed, it was not gentlemen need to leave without paying. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, I turned around and said, well, Mr. Hurd, would you like accept an invitation for lunch at least. He said, that would be great. And it all started from there. We had lunch very soon afterwards. Over lunch, we started on our second name terms. He was Mr. Hurd, I was Mr. Sahakian. By the time we finished the bottle of wine between us, it was Edward and William. <laughs> <laughs> and right at the end, whilst we're having coffee and brandy, and I was preparing my cigar, I was smoking cigar then, and, and in those days you could smoke indoors, mm. as you would mm. remember. And uh, was preparing the cigar to smoke, he said, oh, Edward, what are you going to do if you can't ever go back? And it took me back the question. I said, of course I'm going back. I'm here for a year, maybe two, till things settle mm. down. Mm. Uh, I said, well, the communist revolution uh, started. In those days, it was like, 50, 60 years ago, and it's still going. He said, mm -hmm. what if you can't go back? You're too young to retire. And I think it was possibly a bit of the effect of the wine as well. I started thinking, it was like asking a little boy, what will you do if you grow <laughs> up? Would you like to have a candy shop or be a fireman? <laughs> I thought, I said, well, you know, what I would really love to do is to have a cigar shop so I could have my cigars, and I'm holding it, playing with it as well. Mm -hmm displayed on the walls, uh, uh, pipes, tobaccos, uh, very much like the Davidoff shop in Geneva, which I used to go and buy my cigars there. And again, William took out his pen. He said, and what was the name of the shop, Davidoff? He started writing down. He said, I'll write a letter to see if they would like to have a 
branch or representation in London. I said, no, William, we, we were just talking about dreams of uh, little boys here, now forget it. <laughs> yeah. I said, no, no, don't worry, I'll just write a letter, there'll be no charge. And no charge indeed there was, but within a month he came back, he said, they refused my request, I said, good, there was no intention of opening a shop. I said, however, I didn't give up. I wrote another letter directly to the president of the company. And believe it or not, he's passing through London next week and would be able to see us 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, will you be in London? I said, well, I make sure I will be here. <laughs> 8 o'clock in the morning, quarter to 8. We were at the lobby of the Intercontinental Hotel. We sat there. The elevators were facing us right in front of us and eight o'clock sharp the doors of the elevator opened two gentlemen walked out and my friend William now he's my dear friend he nudged me and said Edward I think it's them so why do you know them have you seen their photograph he said no but it's exactly eight o'clock and they are Swiss it must be them <laughs> It started from there, they came and they sat down. The president of Davidoff, a gentleman called Dr. Schneider, he's passed away now, sadly. And he sat down, introduced himself. He said, I have half an hour to talk to you. And uh, please tell me why do you want to uh, open a Davidoff shop here? And we started chatting and talking. He asked me all sorts of questions, totally irrelevant to the business. I had to figures and amounts and sites and everything to talk about with them. And we started talking about family, family life, family relationships. He really emphasized more about the family aspect than anything else. Interesting. His, one of the first questions was, do you smoke? I said, of course I smoke. Here's my pipe, here's my tobacco, here's my cigar. And he said, I will write to you, but I have a meeting. And he looked at his watch. He said, oh God, I have a I had an appointment at 10 o'clock and now it's half past 10 already. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he terminated the meeting very quickly and he was already late. He went to his meeting. We went uh, away thinking that we'll be here from him or not. And within another 10, 12 days, we had a letter inviting us to Basel in Switzerland and it just started from there. Uh, it was my first venture in life. I've been to many cigar shops, but always on the other side of the counter, always buying, mm. never selling. It was an experience. It started off a bit rough. Uh, I had nightmares some nights, just thinking, you know, what should I do? How should I do it? It's, uh, it's difficult, but I suppose the background I come from, uh, we always dealt with people, you know, produced beer, produced Coca-Cola and uh, we're familiar with dealing with people, pleasing people. Mm. And when I opened the shop, uh, I just uh, kept on thinking, but what do I do? How do I serve people? How do I offer it to them? And suddenly, one night, probably three or four in the morning, sleepless night, it occurred to me, I said, well, it's not all that difficult. I just offer to my customers what I would expect to be offered myself. From that day on, I had no problem whatsoever. And it's, it's been a joy and a pleasure, 33 years uh, selling cigar, supplying cigar. Uh, and cigars, as you know, they're the instruments of pleasure. Anybody who smokes a cigar is a nice person, is a gentleman, a true gentleman, and a real gentleman as well. And it's a pleasure dealing with them. And what what do you think it is that links? I, I think that too. I, I I've I enjoy cigar, and I think all of the people who I've met through cigars are nice people. But it's really interesting to understand what it is that brings that, that brings those two things together: being being a gentleman and, and, and enjoying a cigar. And that's a, that's the, is it the sixty thousand or sixty million dollar question? <laughs> Uh, I have a dear friend, Simon Chase, uh, who's also very well, you know Simon as well, is involved in the cigar industry, and we often talk about that. Because when you look around, all cigar smokers are successful people. 
and all successful people smoke cigars as well, usually. Mm -hmm. So we always think, which comes first? Is it the chicken or the egg? <laughs> or is it the cigar or the success? Uh, but uh, what it does, uh, a cigar, what it does is it relaxes you. When you light up your cigar and you start enjoying it, it relaxes you. When you're relaxed, your blood pressure is slower, your heartbeat is slower, blood pressure is down, and there's less pressure on your heart, and hence less pressure on your heart. You live to be 100 years old. I've got many, many proofs of that. Mm. People reaching their late 80s, 90s, and even exceeding 100 years old, cigar smokers. Uh, it's a very relaxing exercise, and somehow, when you're a cigar smoker, uh, you're a very nice person. Uh, it, 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 every aspect of life you come across, I have a dear friend, he drives a taxi and when you see him he's a perfect gentleman. Just coming down to our interview this morning, I asked uh, for his services. He, on the way coming down with all the traffic and the construction work going on there, he would stop and let every bus and every truck and every pedestrian walk by. Mm. Then he would, although he had the right of right way, but he would stop and let them go. Mm. And I said, Brian, you are a perfect gentleman in your mm. own trade. He said, well, boss, I like doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, yeah. we enjoy uh, being a nice person. I think that's what it's all about at the mm. end of the day. It's part of our life. It becomes uh, a way of life. And it's interesting in, in, in modern life, when everything is so frenetic and so fast and everybody wants information instantly and everybody expects news uh, instantly and everybody wants up-to-date information that rush, 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 rush. You can't do that with a cigar, can you? you oh, no. You're with a cigar. The cigar itself is a result of patience. No cigar is made in 24 hours or 24 months or uh, a few years. It takes years and years of patience, of uh, industry, it, love, care. First of all, it's a product which relies on the sun, the soil, the rain, luck. God forbid you do all the things that are mm. right to do mm. and you get a hurricane and off it goes, gets destroyed. And even when you have your patience, you plant the seed, you get the tobacco plants growing, you take the leaves, you ferment it, you mature it, you prepare it, uh, you turn it into a cigar, even then you still need to look after it in the right conditions and make sure that it turns out to be a product that will give you pleasure. Of course, it takes us no longer than anything between half an hour to couple of hours enjoying a good cigar but that two hours is the condensed time that has taken for that cigar to be developed so you really you're enjoying a product which has taken three four five years sometimes to be made into that cigar which we would enjoy in an hour or mm. two and therefore, uh, somehow, it does relax you. It definitely relaxes you. It, if, if I'm doing anything important, I will always need to have a cigar in my hand, sometimes between my lips, or failing all that in my pocket, at least, <laughs> 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 near my heart. Just to know it's there, then I'm comfortable with then it. Then you're very <laughs> relaxed. <laughs> and your store on the corner of St. James and German Street is, from a gentleman's point of view, r right in the heart of, of, of gentleman's London, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I was very fortunate to be able to get that site. Uh, I'll touch on very briefly on that site because uh, it used to be a vacant shop uh, owned uh, by the Algerian tourist office. The signs were there, but it was always closed. And when we started negotiating with Davidov, I told my friend William, I said, William, this is the shop I would like to have. I think it's very appropriate. And within time and patience, we managed to 
uh, remind uh, the Algerian embassy that they do have a shop here and they're not using goods and eventually we managed to get the shop. It's the gateway to German Street as you know. It's the beginning of German Street and German Street is a very unique street in the world. It's probably the only street that I know of that caters 99.9% .9 for men. Starting from us, on the right hand side you have the Davidoff cigar shop, on the left hand side you have Beretta the gun shop, and from there on you've got all the finest shoes and shirts and suits, uh, right down to the other end. In between we have the uh, famous cheese shop there, but even that, the cheese shop has more men buying cheese than ladies, it's mm -hmm. incredible. Uh, it, it's a lovely street. Uh, we've got a few restaurants in between as well, which is usually occupied more by men than ladies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, of course, I'm very fortunate to have that position. Uh, if you look down from my shop, you will see on St. James's Street all the gentlemen's clubs there, right down to the palace itself, and on to Piccadilly, which is a different world. Mm. The tourists all come to Piccadilly to see the Piccadilly Circus and the famous double-decker buses. Yeah. And of course German Street, which is great. It's, it's, it's a beautiful uh, location. Mm. I'm very fortunate. Yeah, yes. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it, it's wonderful from that point of view. Um, and I know that, uh, I know that, that, that that area grew up because of all the gentlemen's clubs, didn't it? And the, and the, the sort of the businesses that supply them. Absolutely. Um, we have right uh, literally uh, 10 yards away from us White's Club, which is very famous. Prince Charles had his stag night there, if you remember, when he was marrying uh, Diana. And then we have Boodles, we have Brooks, we have uh, the Carlton Club, and it just goes on and on and on, all the way down to the RAC Club. And all these clubs before July 2007, they all had smoking rooms. And all the gentlemen, after their meal, they would sit in the smoking room, enjoy the paper, and smoke a cigar. Mm. Unfortunately, nowadays, the only thing that is left of the smoking room is the name itself. Yes. They still have yeah. the smoking rooms, but no smoking no, is allowed. No, that's right. But the other, the other thing that's interesting is that you chose to, uh, to put your store down between two of the, the most established cigar stores uh, in London, between Dunhill and between Foxes at the bottom, and, and, sort of, and maintain a, a, a gentlemanly relationship is that something that, that the cigar well, it, industry... It, it wasn't intentionally done as such, but I, I wanted to be there. Right. Uh, the fact that Dunhill was a few yards further down on German Street, and in those days it was Robert Lewis, now it's called Fox's, further down on St. James's Street, I think it just made it that much more attractive. Mm. Uh, if you're a cigar smoker, you rather have a few cigar shops nearer to each other than further away because we all share the same customers. Mm. Uh, we all sell the variety of the cigars that are available. And uh, as a cigar smoker myself, if I go to another city visiting a cigar shop, if there's another one literally next door to it, it never fails. I will go and visit that one as well. <laughs> right. Uh, somehow, you know, we're. We, we love uh, seeing shops that sell our loved products. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, it's it's wonderful, and I know uh, because again we've we've talked about this. I know that the the cigar business has, has taken you all over the world, not just to to, to to Cuba where a lot of cigars come from, but all over the world. Well, uh, because of my love for the cigars, and it is a love. Otherwise, I would have never plunge into this uh, uh, business. Uh, I have to tell you this uh, short uh, joke was, uh, you know, Niagara Falls in America and with the waterfalls there and there are tourists standing there always watching and uh, suddenly a lady skips and falls into the water down in the lake and everybody, they run around, they don't know what to do and out of the blue, another gentleman 
jumps right after her into the water, catches her, the helicopters come, the boats come, the lifeguards come, and they pull them out as they pull him out of the water, soaking with water. The reporters run to him. Oh, sir, sir, what, what's your name? You're a hero. Please give us your name. He says, oh, forget my name. Find the guy, this name, who pushed me into the water. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, I, I got pushed into this uh, business uh, because of my friend William. Mm. Uh, but once I was in it, or once in water, you, you might as well swim. Uh, I loved it, and because of the love of the cigar, I do tend to travel and visit as many producers as possible, as well as uh, shops who sell them. Uh, when I got to Cuba regularly every year. The first time I went there, we were invited by Cuba Tobacco in those days, it was called. It was the government arm of cigar production and selling. It was 1987, and since then I've been there every year and sometimes possibly twice a year. Mm. It's nice to meet the people who produce them. It's nice for them to talk to us because we are the front line of their products. We are the ones who sell it to the customers. Mm. So we have a better idea than anybody else if there's a defect in the product, if there's a problem, or there's a mm. demand for a particular size, shape, or blend. Mm. Uh, having said that, uh, I've been going to Dominican Republic since 1990 when Davidov moved from Cuba to the Dominican Republic. I've been going there to see the plantations and the factories there as well. Uh, I have to admit, I have not been to Honduras or Nicaragua, mm -hmm. but that's uh, on my agenda. On your list. Uh, on my list of <laughs> things to do, possibly early next year. And also been to many nice places for cigar receptions, cigar dinners, cigar tastings, uh, from Moscow to St. Petersburg to, to Dubai, uh, to Paris, to Germany, to Switzerland many times. Uh, in America itself, uh, there is uh, a magazine called The Cigar Aficionado, which is mm, almost like the Bible for cigar smokers. And we always tend to read uh, every issue that comes out and they have something called the Big Smoke okay. which is organized twice a year, once in New York, once in Las Vegas and you get about two, three thousand cigar lovers, they come there they fight over the cigars <laughs> and then they all sit down and smoke uh, and it's very interesting to see and they're lovely people, the people you meet in the cigar uh, world uh, these are the same people, if you would want to get an appointment through their secretary to meet them, if you're fortunate enough, you will get an appointment for five minutes, six months down the road. When it comes to cigars, he will sit here next to you and talk to you for hours and hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating. That's the magic it? of cigar. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. It's that, it's that taking that time to, to stop, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And I, I always think of you as the epitome of, of style. Whenever I see you, I always see you impeccably, impeccably dressed. So what does, what does style mean to you as a, as a, as a gentleman? Uh, well, it's, I mean, I've always been like that. I think when you're uh, selling a product, mind you, you've never seen me on a Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> So very Although sensibly, actually we have, very sensibly we have, you close on a Sunday. We, so. we have met in South of France, which you saw how relaxed I was. But I think when you're selling such a uh, wonderful uh, product, it's very important the person producing the cigars to a customer should also be dressed respectably. Because if, if I dress up with my tie and suit, I'm respecting my customer, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of how he looks, that's a different story because usually he's on a holiday. Uh, but I have to be on the same level as the product that I'm selling. And that's very important. I think it's very important to have your hair tidy, shaven properly, the suit, the tie. I have to admit my wife helps me in coordinating the colors. 
I'm very poor at that myself. Yeah. <laughs> Some of us need that. Kind of. <laughs> One thing which is quite also important for me is shoes should be always clean and polished. The customer walks and the first thing I look at is the shoes. And it says a lot about a person. Mm. Mm. And I know, I know uh, that since the smoking ban came in, there's been much more of a, of a challenge for people who enjoy a cigar to, to, to find somewhere to, to smoke. But I know that you are also, uh, you can be very creative in terms of the way you've, you've worked. I'm thinking of your, uh, the event you held with Wilton's a couple of years ago, which was uh, incredibly the, stylish. The, the evening, that, that was a great event. Uh, and it's happening more. First of all, unfortunately, as I said, from 1st of July 2007, indoor smoking in public places is banned. There are a couple of exceptions to that. Uh, one of them is if you are in an area where more than 50% of it is open, then you could smoke. So basically you could sit outside in the balcony, on the pavement, just the top covered. Mm. That still leaves you sufficient amount of space to smoke there. So you, you're seeing more and more of that happening in London. Uh, one of the other exceptions is if you're in prison, because that becomes your uh, place of residence, so you could smoke in prison, but you really don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> the other place where you can smoke is if you are a specialist tobacconist, such as MISO. Uh, that means more than 50% of your total sales must be of tobacco product. In our case, it's possibly 90% mm. or even more. And for that, you're not allowed to smoke, but you're allowed to sample. You're allowed to sample a cigar. Not cigarettes, not pipes, but only cigars. And when you're sampling a cigar, and it is a fact, I'm not making up stories, mm. you have to smoke the cigar from beginning to the end to be able to, to have a 100% idea of exactly what that cigar is. You can't just have two puffs and say, oh, this is a good cigar. No. Mm. The very good cigar could start very good and get worse. It could start terribly and become delicious. Or usually it should really be continuously perfect. But until you don't smoke it all, you won't be able to know that. Therefore, when you're sampling a cigar, you can't put a time limit. If it's a small cigar, you would need 15, 20 minutes, maybe half an hour to sample uh, the cigar and hopefully enjoy it. In some cases, if you're smoking a beautiful double Corona cigar, which is a large seven inch, large ring gauge cigar, you need at least, at least an hour and a half, if not two hours, to come to your opinion about that cigar. The idea is you're allowed to sample it to see if you enjoy it, then buy the box. Right. In the same way you would sample chocolates in a chocolate shop before you buy the box of chocolates or sample the cheese before you buy the whole lump of cheese. Mm. So uh, the, that is uh, the exceptions. It has had an effect on sales. Um, although when you're a cigar level, you always find a way around it. Uh, with the lovely weather such as today, it's not a problem. Yeah. You could even stroll. Uh, down the park and enjoy your cigar. Mm. Uh, if it's raining, if it's mm -hmm. cold, uh, there are ways around it. Many of the hotels have created rooms, outside rooms, out, outdoor uh, smoking areas, as mm. it's referred to, which you really don't feel your outdoors. Mm. They have sufficient heating to keep the cold away. They have sufficient covering to keep the rain away and you, you will sit there in good company, enjoy the cigar, and it's becoming more and more popular. That I do wish, I do wish that our government uh, would have spent a bit more time in coming to that decision, because if you're a cigar smoker, I would have liked to have seen cigar rooms, cigar clubs, where a cigar smoker could go there, smoke as much as he want to, without infringing on anybody else's health, mm. and vice versa. Yeah. In America, as you know, in, in America they are 
very strict with smoking regulations. California, yes. New York, yes. and even in cities like that, they have many, many cigar clubs, yep. cigar rooms, uh, places where people could go inside, they close the door, open the window, whatever, ventilation, and enjoy their cigar without infringing on anybody else's uh, mm. uh, health. And I, uh, in terms of then the, the places to smoke, I know, I know you've recently expanded out, and, uh, and there's a and you have a new establishment. We do. We were uh, very fortunate. We were invited uh, to open a cigar shop in a hotel. The, the hotel is called the Bulgari Hotel. It's one of the finest hotels in London, and it's part of uh, three or four other hotels. They have the main one in. Milan, in New York, and in the Bulgari Hotel they did want to have a small cigar shop near the bar area for their customers because most of their customers are cigar lovers and that was one of their requests when they did the research. Right. And uh, with that invitation and they assured us that they will uh, create a sufficient sampling room which they have. They have created a lovely sampling area, very much comfortable, more or less like this, yeah. nice armchairs, where you could uh, relax, enjoy your cigar, smoke it, and if you're happy with it, then buy uh, more of the cigars there. And because of where it is, I, I've loosened my personal supply a bit <laughs> and uh, you could find some of the very rarest and most delicious and finest cigars in the Bulgari Hotel. Well, you will not find anywhere, not even in my shop. And that's a really interesting point because most people might not appreciate um, that a cigar actually can improve over time with age. Oh, absolutely. Uh, as I said, uh, cigars, they're made from a product which relies on the sun, soil, rain, the terroir, and very much like wine. It does need time at the right conditions to ferment, mature, and to get better. Not all cigars mature in the same way. Again, like wines, there are some cigars which after three, four, five years, nothing much more happens to it. You could still enjoy them, but you really don't need to keep them more than that period of time. There are cigars which are delicious now, and if you keep it for another 10, 15 years, it will be even more delicious. Um, that's perhaps where our expertise come into it. Uh, somehow between my son and myself, we. We spot these cigars, you know, the moment you see a lovely cigar, you smoke it, you know it has potential, very much like wine again. And these cigars, uh, I do, I've always kept them for the last 20 years. Any cigar that was particularly good, I would put some aside. And now we have a whole selection of, as we call it, vintage cigars. Mm. And it does make a difference. It definitely makes a difference. Again, very much like wine. You could have a bottle of Chateau Margo, which was from the years 2008 or 2009, it will be a lovely wine until you drink the Chateau Marco from 1986 or 1989. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, but, uh, but that's an, uh, an interesting point in terms of the, of the, of, of putting away and actually making that investment in, in cigars like that, because that it is an investment, isn't it, to, to put them away and, and, uh, and store them? Well, absolutely. It's not only it's an investment, it's a wise investment. Mm. I always tell people, especially these days, it's probably one of the best investments you could do, as long as you buy the right product. Mm. Uh, we have cigars which were originally being sold at, I think they were about 20, 22 pounds, uh, and now they're selling at 300 pounds. Wow. I have cigars, the Davidoff Dom Perignon, uh, which when I opened the shop in May 1980, the price tag of that was six pounds 25 each cigar. And they came in boxes of 25. 
So a box of 25 was, oh, oh God, <laughs> about 100 and something pounds or pounds whatever. And now you will be lucky if you find a box for less than six or seven thousand pounds. Mm. Mm. Uh, but having said that, you could buy cigars which are produced today and within, I promise you, in the next three, four years, you will make a good, healthy 15, 20, 25 percent profit. And that's not easy in this day and age. These days <laughs> it's... If you pick the right cigar. If you pick the right cigar, very much like property, you know. Mm -hmm. Some people make fortunes out of selecting and finding and buying a house in the right uh, location and some lose a fortune. Mm. Mm. And then, and, and you mentioned your son, you see the, the next generation coming on in, in, the, in the cigar business? Oh, absolutely. I'm very fortunate uh, because my son, when he, uh, well, when we moved over here, he went to school and then uh, from there on to high school, university, graduated and went into the banking industry. He worked for a number of years for CIBC, from there to the Royal Bank of Scotland. Uh, he was headhunted actually there. <laughs> and uh, he was involved in an area where they made up all these lovely financial packages and sold it off. And when the problem started, his department was one of the very first departments that was closed down. And he took two, three, four months to think about it. But I said, son, you know, here's a business, come and help me at least until you, if you want to go back into mm. banking, I wouldn't recommend it, but it's entirely up to you. Mm. And uh, this is a number of years ago now, 2008 it was, I think. And since then he's been working with me and within hopefully near future I will be working less uh, for him and he <laughs> will be working more <laughs> for himself. Um, he's very knowledgeable, he's very much interested and of course he's a cigar lover. You cannot have somebody in the cigar industry if he doesn't love the product. If you don't love the product you could do your best, it will never be the same. It's like any other industry. Anything you love, you will do it with love and you will see the fruits of that love. Mm. Mm. And I think Eddie, he's great. As a matter of fact, he's suffering from grout as, for, uh, gout as we're talking because mm. all the good life is enjoying. <laughs> <laughs> but he will uh, learn that with experience, that uh, right. to do things in moderation. Moderation in everything. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And if you uh, just just thinking, uh, that, that's that's a, that's great for the great for the future. I think because I know Eddie and I know he's a a chip off the old block, and it's uh, it's it's great to know that the that the the store's going to be in safe hands. Uh, and I hope we'll, we'll continue to see you in the store for a long, long time for the, for the future. If if you look down. German Street. How have things changed over the changed over the years in in the, in the last thirty years, thirty three years? Not much changed. Interesting. Most of the shops in German Street, they don't really change hands that frequently. Very rarely, matter of fact. Uh, one change, which was, uh, I was sad to see it go. It was the Dunhill shop. Mm. It was there for years and years. And they moved on to Barclay Square because they bought a whole building and they have this concept of a Dunhill Club. But the building they were in, it, it brought a lot of memories for me because I used to buy my cigars from Dunhill as well. As a matter of fact, I still have cigars that I used to buy before I opened the shop in their keep as we're talking, mm. which I'm sure it's there in good condition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, that building itself, during the war, it was bombed. A bomb fell on, part of the building was destroyed. And the story is, uh, the manager of the shop was like 4, 4.30 in the morning, immediately called the Prime Minister's office, and he spoke to the Prime Minister's secretary. He said, can you please uh, let Sir Winston Churchill know that we had a bomb exploded and destroyed part of our building but do tell him 
his cigars are safe. <laughs> 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 and that building was there. It was a beautiful piece of history there. Mm. And uh, they moved out of there. Mm. But other than that, not many changes. Uh, the other, only other change that is quite uh, visible is across the street from me. It used to be the NatWest Bank. Uh, for years and years. I remember the man bank manager from time to time, he was a smoker as well, so he would knock on his window and I would wave at him and he would beckon to me, come over. So that was our secret code, like 10, 10, 30 in the morning. I would go across the street with a couple of cigars. He said, it's just very quiet in the bank. Let's have a smoke and a coffee. And he used to provide the coffee, I used to provide the cigars. <laughs> now, of course, that uh, shop, uh, they've gone, and it's turned into the Barretta shop, which they're lovely neighbors to have. It's, mm. it's a joy and pleasure to walk in there and see the, some of the guns they have worth hundreds of thousands of pounds. Mm. It's beautiful items. But I'm not into hunting, so no. Uh, no. it doesn't affect much to me. But it's still, we shared the, exactly the same customers. The number of customers who come with their bag walking into my shop or vice versa. Mm. And I know you're a hat lover, aren't you? Is, is, did you buy your I do. hats in German Street? I where do, do, you, where I do, you, do. do you choose? Uh, at the moment, my favorite shop is Bates, which is... Uh, next door to Hilditch and Key, matter of fact, it's part of Hilditch and mm. Key. They have a very nice uh, gentleman, Jean-Luc, he's French. Uh, he sources the Panama hats. Um, it's not easy to get them. Right. Panama hats, the real good ones, mm -hmm. uh, they're quite scarce and very difficult to get hold of. Uh, but when he does have a very fine quality hat of my size and shape, he again knocks on my window. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. <laughs> I, yes, a constant stream of little yeah, knocks on the window, yeah. people popping down to see you. Let's talk a little specifically about cigars. I, um, I know a little, but let's assume someone is, is new and, and, and wants, uh, wants to, an introduction to cigars. How, how would they start? How would they, uh, how would they start out? Well, first they would have to come to my shop. That's the first step. Good stuff. <laughs> uh, my question would be, and they have to be obviously open and honest about it. To walk in and say, I know nothing about cigars and I want to enjoy a good cigar. And it happens a lot, mm. especially with the, uh, a younger generation. They're quite open about it. They're not embarrassed about not knowing anything. Mm. So. I would like to enjoy a good cigar. I've never smoked. This is going to be my first cigar. What would you recommend? And it's wonderful to he hear those words because then you know exactly where you stand. My first question is, have you ever smoked cigarettes, pipes, or anything? If they say, yes, I'm a cigarette smoker, I tell them, well, stop smoking a cigarette, then come and see me in six months' time. But I do make one or two recommendations. Mm. However, the best one is a person who's never smoked cigarettes and he really wants to enjoy the finest in his life. Uh, I would recommend always a smaller, milder cigar. Advise him not to smoke it on an empty stomach. Right. It's very important. Uh, you should always eat something before you smoke a fine cigar. Uh, preferably with red wine or if you can afford it a nice glass of port brandy will do the same and depends where you would be if you're on top of a mountain probably nice a uh, glass of grappa will serve the same <laughs> purpose or if you're on a beach uh, a fine mixture of rum and some coconut juice or pineapple juice or just rum on the rocks mm. uh, will be a very good complement to a good cigar. Uh, a mild cigar, not too big, enjoyed slowly, is a very good starting point for any young beginner to enjoy a good cigar. Mm. 
and cutting and lighting the sort of the, the pantomime around. Well, yes, that is very important. Uh, it's quite important. Uh, well, before cutting, uh, storing and keeping, but that we would do for a young uh, beginner. Uh, but uh, when you, I always offer to the customers, uh, would you like me to cut the cigar for you? And they usually say yes. So I actually show them how to cut it. You have to cut the right at the top where the curves start. Lighting a cigar, you could light it with a gas lighter, matches without sulfur, or pieces of cedar wood, but never use a petrol lighter, like a Zippo lighter. Mm. And I usually try to demonstrate lighting a cigar to a customer for the first time to make sure the tip of the cigar is lit all around. Therefore, when you start drawing on it, it will burn evenly and properly. Mm. And the enjoyment of a cigar, because it's very different to cigarette smoking, isn't it? It's not, it's not um, you know, you think of cigarette smokers getting up first thing in the morning and desperately wanting a cigarette or, or having to have one after having to have one at certain times of the day. It's, it's totally two different worlds. Mm. Cigarettes, are an addiction, cigars are a pleasure. I have to tell you this, and I'm not sure if you will want to censor it later on or not, but we were in, a few years ago in Havana, and Jeremy Irons was there, and he was elected uh, Havana Man of the Year for uh, public relations, I think, because he was also smoking cigars, uh, and he was there. They awarded him that lovely award. It was in front of 2,000 people, audience there, it was the cigar, it was in February, it was their cigar event. And Jerry Irons went onto the stage to receive the award and when they gave it to him, beautiful statuette and two boxes of cigars. And he looked around and he said, well, most of you might be surprised that I'm getting this award because you know I smoke more cigarettes and not all that many cigars. He said, but I have to tell you, when you smoke a cigarette, it's like having sex. But when you smoke a cigar, it's like making love. He said, I promise you from now on, since I have this award as well, I will be making more love and less sex. <laughs> <laughs> but he described it so truly, yeah. because uh, when you in, light up a cigar, it's pure pleasure. Mm. You don't inhale it, it doesn't go into your lungs, it doesn't uh, have that effect of uh, creating cancer of lungs and everything else. You're smoking a product which is pure tobacco, 100%, nothing added to it. On the other hand, cigarettes, you have paper, additives, coloring, flavoring, chemicals, everything but real decent tobacco there. Mm. And it is an addiction. And when you light up a cigarette, leave it in the ash tree, it burns right through and you see the effect. Uh, the smoke clings onto your clothing, where else with cigars, it doesn't. Mm. Uh, every night when I go home, I hang my suit, I have a little balcony there, and the next morning when you look at it and smell it, there's no trace of smoke left. Mm. And I smoke at least three to four, maybe five cigars a day. Edward, it's been a real pleasure talking um, and I know yes I'm, I'm delighted to, 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 to hear that the, the future of the of the Davidoff stuff with, store with uh, with Eddie is, uh, is going to be in good hands for the future we're going to move on now and do the the ten gentlemen's questions that we ask every gentleman at the end of the uh, of the interview Okay, so Edward, the, uh, the ten questions we, we ask every, everybody. Um, first of all, what is it that embodies a, a gentleman for you? Difficult question, but yet very easy. Uh, I think good manners. Good manners. Excellent. And anybody will make a person a gentleman, definitely. Good. What is the most romantic thing that, that you've ever done? Oh, God. Uh, 
I have to be careful what I say not to get into any trouble. <laughs> no, but I, I think the most, I thought about it a lot about this question. Uh, the most romantic thing was the first time when I met my wife and it was in a gathering in a party and she was standing there with her back towards me and I sort of looked at her and said, I'd like to dance with that lady and you know, when you're a younger age, I was only 20, 21. Uh, got enough courage to go right up to her and ask her if she would like to dance with me. And she sort of stared into my eyes and I stared in her eyes. And we held hands, started dancing. And since then, 43, 44 years later, we're still together. Mm. <laughs> so that, that, to me, that was very romantic. I, we always remember that. And uh, it, it doesn't get any better for me, at least. Wonderful. If you could bring one gentlemanly trait into business, what, what would that be? Oof. Integrity, humility, integrity. Oh, in, the, in one word I will say integrity. Excellent. What element of grooming is most important for you for a gentleman? <laughs> for me it's definitely be clean shaved, good haircut. <laughs> And that's probably the most important one. Excellent. Who do you think of? Name a, a, an iconic gentleman, a gentleman, someone you think of as a... As a real gentleman. Mm. Uh, there's definitely one name that always stands out for me. This gentleman, he's passed away now, it was uh, Mark Burley. Mark Burley, who had all the beautiful clubs, uh, Annabelle's, and Harry's Bar, and if you ever visit the establishment, you will know why. But he was a fantastic gentleman as well. Excellent. What's the most important item in your in a gentleman's wardrobe? Uh, again, I, I thought about that. It might not be part of a wardrobe, but it's definitely my watch. My watch is very important to me for several reasons but most of all because I always like to be on time As a matter of fact if you look at my watch it's always three minutes ahead right right and uh, that says it all I think why should there be more gentlemen in the world because then the world will be even a better place <laughs> the more gentlemen in the world the more nicer people will be to each other and it's a very important factor uh, these days, unfortunately, the people are very selfish. Everybody thinks for himself. They rather sit in their seat in the bus, in the train, and let an elderly lady standing up. They couldn't care less. Mm. Whereas, if they were real gentlemen, they would stand up and offer their seat to somebody else. Excellent. Who needs it. What? key skill do you think every young gentleman should be taught? In my case, definitely they should be taught how to cut a perfect cut with a cigar and how to enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would teach them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. And what should a gentleman never be without? No. Sense of humor. Lovely. I think a sense of humor is very important. Excellent. And now we just ask you to finish this sentence. A gentleman should always... A gentleman should always choose his own cigar. Okay. If a butler comes and says, I want to buy cigars for my master, I'm sure he's not a real cigar smoker. And it doesn't happen very often. Right. It's... Uh, as I said earlier on, it happens so many times. Uh, probably the best example is uh, the King Hussein of Jordan. He could have had anything, the tip of his hand, you know, he had his drivers, the bodyguards, everything. When it came to his cigars, he would drive up to the shop, come into the shop, ask his bodyguards to stay outside. Only his assistant would come in to pay, and he would go into the cigar room touch, feel, and choose his own cigars. Come out, the assistant will pay for it, but even then, he would not part with it. 
he would hold the bag. The amount of times they were so sure to open it for you, Your Excellency, Your Majesty. Mm. So, no, no, no. I want to carry my own cigars. <laughs> Everything else you could bring. Right. But my cigars, I carry it. And he always wanted to choose and carry his own cigars. And I think that uh, that's what a gentleman should always do. Wonderful. Edward, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. The and pleasure uh, was mine. Thank you. It is wonderful sitting here and talking with an old friend. <laughs> it's a thank shame we can't much. smoke indoors, but here we are. <laughs> there we are. Edward, thank you. Thank you.